Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see everybody able to make it out today. Make sure my volume's all the way up. It's good to see everybody. Um, today, if you would like to follow along with us, we're going to be preaching out of uh, the book of 1 Peter and the second chapter. So turn with us to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We had spent some time uh, a, while, a while back um, when we were still still being able to, to gather together, we were looking at 1 Peter uh, at the church, and uh, we're going to go back there today, and what we're going to preach on today is we're just going to preach on um, just practical Christian living, um, not anything that's going to be super, um, you know, super shocking or anything. It's going to be things that we probably already know, but things that we need reminded of at times. So 1 Peter chapter 2, and before we get started, uh, we want to open up with a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us, God, to look at the word today. Uh, Lord, we just ask God that you would just bless us as we open up the word of God. Lord, help us to bring glory to your name. God, most of all, we pray, Lord, for lost souls that may be watching. Uh, Lord, we pray, God, that they would come to you, Lord, believing in your son, repenting of their sins. We ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. All right, so 1 Peter chapter 2, where we will begin, and um, we're going to start uh, with the ninth verse, and the goal today is we're going to try to preach through verses uh, 9 through 17, <coughs> excuse me, and, um, and then, uh, if it be God's will, the next time we're together, uh, hopefully Wednesday, we will try to look at verses... Um, 18 throughout the remainder of the chapter. So 1 Peter chapter 2, and the, the message begins like this. It, it begins with a reminder to, to the congregation that this is being written to and to all of us today. It, it, it's given us a reminder of who we are. So God instructs the Apostle Peter to write these words in the ninth verse, but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So he tells us, and he's speaking here to um, a lot of Gentiles, and of course there's, there's uh, Jewish Christians mixed in as well. He tells them that, look, you people, you, you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood, and a lot of times we probably don't think of ourselves as royalty, nor do we think ourselves as, as priests, but we are. We have been brought into the family of God through the blood of Christ. We are royal through him, and we are a priesthood in bringing people to him and spreading the gospel. It says we are a holy nation, a peculiar people, and the, the word peculiar here, it means to be, to be picked out. And to be owned, and we are owned by God. When we, you know, come to Jesus, you know, we were a slave to sin. We were lost. Then we came to know Christ, and we became the possession of God, which is an, an awesome thing if you sit and you think about it, you know, because he tells them, he says, you know, God called you out of darkness. You know, all of us here were involved in things that we shouldn't have been involved in. We were all lost. We were all doing sinful things and some of us were perhaps into darkness a little more than others but in the midst of our wrong in the midst of all of those things god called us out of that into his marvelous light and he reminds them here speaking to those who are gentile um, in the 10th verse he said which in time past were not a people you know when we look into the old testament in order to be uh, in order to be saved, in order to know the Lord and, and go to heaven in the Old Testament, excuse me, <coughs> you, um, you had to become a Jewish person if you were outside of the nation of Israel. You, know, you had to believe and you had to become a Jewish person. Um, and when the Lord died on the cross, um, all of those barriers were broken down. You know, God used the nation of Israel in the Old Testament to be his light to the world. They were to be something different. And then, 
as Christ came and as the Apostle Paul was instructed to write, there is no difference between Jew or Greek now. We are the light now. We who are saved, whether you are a Jewish person who's been saved or, or whether you're Gentile, and what Gentile simply is is anybody who's not a Jewish individual. Um, you know, anybody who is saved now, you have... Uh, you have become the people of God, and, and if you were not a Jewish person, you were not considered a people. You were not someone um, that you would automatically think would come to know God. Um, there are examples, without a doubt, of Gentile people in the old, or yes, in the Old Testament that did get saved without question. You have. Um, many examples, but it was not something that was common. It was not that God did not want those people to be saved. He did. Um, they simply needed to to come into and, and join the nation of Israel. Israel was something that was different. <coughs> so is the church today. So, so in time past, uh, we're not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So he's reminding this audience before he gets into this, God is leading him to write this, that, uh, you know, understand that, that at one time you were lost, at one time you were in darkness, at one time you were not a people of God, at one time you were not, uh, you did not own the promises of God, but now you have been chosen. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal pri priesthood. You are a holy nation. The church is a holy nation. He's using that comparison, like we said, to the comparison of the way God used Israel in the Old Testament. And so um, he says, look, he says, and, and your purpose is that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, there are many ways, excuse me, my allergies are acting up. There are many ways to uh, show forth the praises of God, but one of the most important ways is the way we live in front of the world. You know, the Apostle Peter, the Lord is is instructing him on how God wants us to live. And, and like I said, this message is not going to be um, some difficult message to understand. These are simple things that we probably already all know, but they are things that we need reminded of of times. So in the 12th verse, he begins telling us these things that we can do that would show forth the praises of God. That That is, as, as we would call them, just simply practical Christian living. <clears throat> Let me get, grab me a drink of water here. This uh, These allergies and this time of year is, is murder on me. So as we continue on down through here, it tells us in the 12th verse, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, and here he is, he is telling them, having their conversation honest among the Gentiles, um, they are, you know, they would have been Gentile people, but here's the thing, they are now something different. It doesn't matter if they were Jew, doesn't matter if they were Greek, they are something completely different now. They have been bought by the blood of Christ, and uh, these particular people would be, in this congregation, would be around mostly Gentile people. And so he says here, look, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, and the, the word conversation, um, it, it is meaning in the original language, our manner of life, the way we live. And this is a, a very big, all-encompassing word. It, it is speaking of um, our actions that people can see. It is speaking of the words we use. Um, the things that we watch, the things that we listen to, it, it, it's it's a just an all-encompassing word about how that we live, and the apostle here is instructed to write, you know, having your manner of life honest among them, you know, live a life that is honest among them, live a life that is real among those around you that are lost. Um, don't be something fake. Be honest. Be genuine. And it goes on to say that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know, something that I've often spoke of, and 
it's going to continue to get worse without question until the church is taken away. But as time has progressed, we have seen a, it's already been in the rest of the world, but it's even growing a lot in our own country. Um, as we see time progress and march on, we are seeing a hatred and a dislike for Christianity and Christians in the world that we live in. Um, like I've said before, you can see it all around the world, but you see it rising up in our modern age. And we, we've talked about this before in many messages, just a quick example of, of something recently. You know, they've, um, I, I, and we'll, we'll talk about how this applies to us in a little bit. You know, the people, the, the government has, has wanted us to stay home and not gather together. And some churches have, have still chosen to have uh, drive-in services where they broadcast or the, the preacher preaches from a megaphone and the people stay in their car and leave their windows rolled up and, and everything like that. And some places um, have begun to give citations and different things to people who have done that. And you know, here's here's the the amazing part of that. These people are gathering in a parking lot, in their cars with the windows rolled up. Uh, the message and everything is being broadcast um, a lot of times through a specific uh, FM channel frequency, and the people sit in their cars and listen to it. And they they don't want people to do that, but it's still okay and it's still fine to go to the liquor store and buy liquor. Um, the places where marijuana is sold, those places are still open. Um, the abortion clinics are still open and people gather in all these places and it's fine to go to Walmart. <clears throat> it's fine to go to Lowe's and all these many things, but you know, they have um, in some places become very upset with people simply congregating in a parking lot. And that, that's, that's, uh, that's a small example, but it kind of shows us, you know, where we are, where we are with all of this. And things are just going to continue to get worse, as I have said in messages past, you know, because of what we, what we believe, because of what the Word of God says about sin, we will not be liked in this world. As this world grows darker and our light begins to shine brighter due to the darkness, as we stand up against those things that are wrong, um, the world is going to become more and more against us because, as, as I've said, our message goes against the grain of the flesh. It goes against the grain of the world. And they may speak against us, as Peter said, as evildoers. You know, but there's going to come a day and there's going to come a time when every lost soul will stand before God Almighty. And they will then know that we have been genuine, that we have been real. And they will glorify God because of our good works. They will look back and they will say they were the real deal. And, and something else to think about as well in this 12th verse is this, is, you know, as, as you seek to live for the Lord, um, you will not always be the most popular person at your workplace. You will not always be the most popular person at school. But here's the thing about it. You might be living for him and there might be an individual who seemingly hates you because of your faith, because of you living in him. But if you live for him and they get saved, you know, they will they will look back and they will see your genuineness. So live an honest manner of life among those around us that are lost. Now, as we know that and we say, well, okay, living an honest life, living a good Christian life, um, being genuine, that's, that's obvious. I know that. We start to get into some things that might become and will become, as time goes on, a bit more difficult. You say, well, what are those things? Well, listen to this in the 13th verse. It says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king of supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. 
basically in a nutshell, it's telling us to be good law abiding citizens. Now you might say, well, is there a place that, that we, we cut off from all of that? Well, if something becomes a place where uh, it, it is sin, then of course we don't, we don't support laws that are promoting sinful acts. You know, just because, um, just because drinking is legal, that doesn't obviously mean that we support it. Just because uh, now smoking marijuana is legal doesn't mean that we support it. Just because abortion is legal doesn't mean we support it. On and on and on and on I could go. But as far as living our everyday lives, as far as the things in life that are just simply laws of the land, we are called in the Word of God, whether we sometimes like it or not, to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man, it says, for the Lord's sake. So be a good law-abiding citizen, in other words. You know, follow those things. These things, you know, if if we're speaking to the fact that we're trying to bring praise to the name of God, if we're speaking to the fact that we are trying to be a light uh, to the lost world, and we, we think about this, you know, how much of a light would we be if we are someone who is rebellious in nature, you know, as far as the things and ordinances of the laws of the land are. We're probably not going to be a huge light, are we? And these things will become more and more difficult as time goes on. You know, we can see in our country the direction that things are heading. Um, I am a, a big advocate of the right to bear arms. I believe in that. Um, I, I believe that it is a God-given right to protect your family and to protect your home. And, and we see a fight today in our, um, in our political arena, and it's going to, to get worse as time goes on because we know we're leading up to a time where there will be a, a tyrant that that leads the world, which is the Antichrist, we know that that time is coming. And so we know that there is a push in our country and it will continue to grow stronger uh, uh, as far as this push against our our right to bear arms and as far as our, um, our freedoms concerning firearms and things. And you know, here's the thing about it, you know, I, I know people, I, I know we get fired up, I get fired up too. I get fired up too. Um, we want to, um, see someone told me they can barely hear me. Hopefully, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, but like I said, they, they want to have this push to, uh, lessen our freedoms as far as firearms go and, and listen to me. You know, we, we get fired up and we want to, re you know, we start talking rebellion and, and all these things. Listen. Um, it, it's not it, we as Christians are not called to rebel and that, that's just a simple truth we're, we are not um, we are called the Bible says to submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake this is to be a light to the world it is it is for no other reason and that's difficult for us to swallow sometimes but that is God's desire and God's plan for us we are to be a light to the world around us, just as the Lord was. And so as we continue on down here, he tells us why. He says, if you, in, in every aspect of your life, in every aspect of your life, you are genuine and honest as you live. The, the, the things that you say, the things you watch, the things that you allow your ears to hear, your interactions with people, um, your business interactions, and all of these things, and you are seeking to be a, a good law-abiding citizen. He says in the 15th verse, he says, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You know, there are people in the world that they just, for their own rebellious sake, they don't want to accept the gospel. They don't want to to believe. And we've talked about that in messages before. You know, there there are people that's it's not because there's not enough evidence. It's not because of of anything other than the fact that they don't want to repent 
they don't want to give their life to Jesus. They don't want to. And they'll use a myriad of excuses why. Um, you know, there's not enough evidence. Well, you know, I can't really believe this. How do we know there's a God? And then you can go on to, to other uh, instances of, of excuses. Perhaps they do believe there's a God. Perhaps they might even believe that that Jesus is the Son of God, but they don't want to. They'll use a myriad of excuses. Well, you know, this happened at church, and I've seen Christians do this, and I've seen Christians do that. And listen, ultimately, those are just excuses. But when you live your life as, as the Apostle Peter is being instructed to write to us to live here, it says, this is the will of God, for so is the will of God. And, and the things that we've just read, that we submit ourselves, we are good law-abiding citizens, that we live an honest life, we are genuine, and our life, we try our best, not that we'll be perfect, but we, we try to um, live our life matched up as best we can to what we see the Word of God written. He says, this is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And this word ignorance simply means unknowingness, not knowing. And we talked about this not knowing before. This not knowing is, is not, you know, in the context of this verse, we see this same word used also in 1 Thessalonians 4, the word ignorance here. In 1 Thessalonians 4, the apostle Paul was instructed to write, uh, My brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. That word means unknowing, just as it does here. But this word is in reference to, uh, to lost people. And so we could go back to the Psalms where it says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. And the word fool in that word in the Hebrew, it means stupid and wicked. And it means that they are choosing to be such. Uh, so here we are, we are told that this is the will of God, that with our well-doing, with our living for him, we put to silence that type of ignorance of foolish men. They may not want to believe the word of God, and they may poke fun at it, and they may mock it. But listen, there is something, you know, I've, I've often said this, there is always the need for us to invite people to church. There is always the need for us to um, to verbally speak the gospel, okay? And God uses that without question. But listen to me, the most powerful, the most powerful tool you have in your toolbox for witnessing is your daily walk in front of people. That is the most powerful tool you have for witnessing. And I'm not, you know, I, you guys have heard me enough on here. Those of you that don't attend LaGrange and are watching, you've heard me enough on here the past few weeks if you've watched to, to know that I do not believe that we will be perfect in our life. I don't believe that at all. Uh, we, will, we, will be, we will fail. But listen, when people see consistency, in your walk with the Lord, and they see that you are real, they see that you are genuine, they see that you are something different. They may want to deny this book. They may want to uh, to not want to accept God. They may not want to repent and all these things, but one thing they can't deny is the life that you live in front of them is different from every other person they see, and they will understand and they will know that the difference between you and all these other people is the Lord Jesus Christ. We live this way to bring glory to his name. And so that's what this is saying. It is saying that this is God's desire that we live this way, that we submit ourselves, that we are not rebellious, that we have a, a life uh, that people will see our good works and that by all of these things, their words against Christ and against us, they will be put to silence. They will be put to silence because of the life that we live. And so as we continue on down through here, a couple more verses we're going to look at, and we are going to uh, come to a close to this message. So in the 16th verse, uh, the Apostle Peter writes, As free 
and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. So we read that 16th verse, and the Apostle Peter, um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny and amazing. It shouldn't be amazing because God already knows us, but as we read down through this, there is a reaction that comes into the hearts of us when we talk about things like submitting to the laws of the land and, and all these things. There is this, uh, this rising up within us, and, and just, just like we talk about with the Second Amendment, you know, that there's going to come a time when um, it, it's going to get worse and worse as far as those things go in our country. And, you know, when it comes to these things, we could say, well, you know what? I'm Christian, and, and I know it's, it's my right to have a firearm, and, you know, they're not going to take my guns away from me. They might come to my house, but I ain't handing them over. We could go down that road, and we could go down many other roads as far as the way we live in front of people. We could take an attitude of, well, you know what? It don't matter what anybody thinks about me. I know that I'm saved, and you know what? If they don't like that, then that's fine with them. I know what God has done for me, and you know what? I'm not going to be uh, super worried <clears throat> about the things I say and how I live, the things I put on Facebook, the words that I speak, uh, all this stuff. I'm not going to be all that worried about it because, listen, I'm free. I am free. I have freedom in Christ, and, and that is true. You do. The Apostle Paul writes about that. You know, those things that are not specifically written down in the Word of God as sin, the Apostle Paul writes about that and tells us that, you know what, we, we do have freedom. He says, there is freedom. He says, all things are lawful as far as the things that are, are, are not written to be out as, as plainly sin in the Word of God. He says, all things are lawful unto me. But what else did he say after that? Not all things are profitable unto me. And listen, when we go back to uh, that ninth verse and we read that we are a peculiar people, we are a possession. We are owned by him. He has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And like I said, the most effective way to be a light is by the life that you live in front of people. If you live, if I, I don't care if every day of your life you invite someone to church. And I don't care if every day of your life you, um, you give someone verbally the gospel. If you don't live a life that matches up to what you say you believe... You aren't, you're not going to get anywhere. But people see the life that we lead. They see our actions. And so if we, and listen, like I said, we're not going to be perfect. I don't want someone thinking I'm saying we're going to be perfect. We're not. But listen, the life that we lead is the best witness that we have. And so the Apostle Peter writes, listen, he says, we're, we're going to put the silence the ignorant of foolish men by these things that we're doing. We're doing them as free and not using our liberty as a cloak of maliciousness or as a cloak of ill will. As the Apostle Paul said, all things are, are lawful to me, but not all things are profitable. Not all things are good. Listen, uh, the life that we live is much more of a witness and a testimony to people than just simply inviting them to church. It's much more of a witness and a testimony than just verbally giving them the gospel. Because like I said, if they see something different from the life that you live, you, you can give them that invitation all day long. But listen, um, you know, I've, I've told people this before. If you, if you ever get on you know, Facebook, and if, if I post things in there uh, with vulgar language, I post things there with questionable content. Are you going to ever listen to me as a pastor? Are you ever going to come to the church I pastor? Are you going to think anything about the witness that I give? You won't. You, you'll be like, what, what's this guy doing? You know, he's, he's what, what, what's he doing? And you know, it's the same for every Christian out there. And so we live like this because we are free. We submit to every law. We have our manner of life honest among the Gentiles because we are free. We don't want to use our liberty as a cloak of ill will and say, well, you know what? It don't matter. I got mine. I'm saved. You know what? I'm, I'm going to just go on about it. And you know what? If they want to accept God, fine. 
I'm not worried about it. Listen, we're not called to live that way. Uh, we are called to be the servants of God and to, you know, it says plainly in the 15th verse, for so is the will of God, the desire of God, that we live this way. Last verse that I want to cover, this is a big one. In the 17th verse, it says this, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Again, just talking about practical living as a Christian. Honor all men. This word honor in the original language, it, it means to place value upon all people. Place value upon all people. Now, it's easy for all of us, myself included, to look at someone and, and look at things that they've done in their life and the way that they live and say, well, you know what, look at what they've done. I can't place any value on them. Listen, the Bible isn't saying placing value on them because of their actions, nor is the Bible saying place value on their actions. The Bible is telling us to look upon the person, upon the soul, and to place an intrinsic value upon them because the Bible says we are created in the image of God. Because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because the Bible tells us, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible tells us that on Mount Calvary's hill, Christ died for all people. And you know, God can take anyone, regardless of what they have done, and He can forgive them, and He can, he can transform their life and change them. So we are to treat all people with a, a value upon their being. Everyone, absolutely everyone. We are called to love the brotherhood. We used this portion of uh, this verse a while back in a, a message, and we talked about in that message the need for us to really love each other as Christians. Um, we talked about how that, you know, we've, we've come to a place where... Um, where we're not able to gather into church buildings anymore, and hopefully that'll come to an end sometime soon. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting back into the house of God with everyone. But we've come to find out that during this time, the church was never the building, was it? The church was all the people of God, and you can get on here and you can hear um, many preachers that, that are living in the tri-state area, and you can hear other people sing and, and all these many things. And so, you know, you, you've got all these things that are absolutely fantastic. And what we talked about in that message was how that, you know, when we go back into our churches, let's not allow these walls that we have around us to to alienate us and to say, well, you know, this is my church here and you know, let us love every Christian, love the brotherhood we are called to do. So love each other. Fear God, we are told, and honor the king. There is this humongous um, divide in our country at that like I've, I've never seen before, politically speaking. And... Um, I, I don't know where you stand as far as your political affiliation. I don't know who you voted for, and quite frankly, it doesn't matter. Because we are told in the Word of God to honor our king. Right now, we might have a president that you like. Later on this year, we might elect a president you don't like. And then in 2024, we might elect a president you like. We might elect a president you don't like. And the same goes for me, the same goes for every Christian. But here's the thing. We are called, as the people of God, to honor the king, to place a value upon him because he is the leader of our nation. There, I'm trying to think of how I want to say this. I'm just going to say it bluntly because I feel like it needs to be said. It's what's on my heart. Listen, some of you are more concerned about what you post politically than what you post spiritually on Facebook. That's just the truth. You're more worried about your support for the president or your lack of support for the president and your political affiliation in the party than with the party than you are anything else. 
we're called to honor the president or the king regardless of of whether we like that individual or not that's what the word of god tells us to do that's not me telling you that's that's what god says and so we need to do that regardless of who's in the office you might say Aaron but their actions their policies they're this they're that I know I understand I I can I can think of I've been through several presidents in my lifetime and I can go back and I can think of policies of every president that I've disliked and policies of every president that I've liked I can sit back and I can uh, I can remember the ones I voted for and the ones I didn't vote for. As Christians, we need to vote biblically, as biblically as we can. But regardless of who gets elected, we need to honor the leaders of our country, the leaders of our community, the leaders of our state, so forth and so on. And if you don't like them, vote them out. But listen, we are called to be a light to the world. And being a light to the world does not require us to be perfect. But it, it does require a certain type of living that can go against the grain of the human, the natural lost state of the human soul. We are called to have an honest life. We are called to submit to the laws of the land. What do those two things mean? Just simply be a good person. As far as the 12th verse goes, as far as the 13th verse goes, obey the laws. As far as um, as far as the, the the rest of it goes, you know, um, don't live your life just thinking about the fact that you're saved. Think about others and how the way you live, how the way you speak, how the way you talk, how the way you post things, the things you type, on and on and on. We could go. Think about how these things might affect others. You know, honor all people. Place value upon every individual. Love your Christian brothers and sisters. Love them. Honor the king. Fear God. You know, these things are just simple things that can go a long way in, in showing people that Jesus is the most important thing in our life. And when people see that and they see that our life is based off of the fact that Jesus is the most important thing and they see consistency in our daily living they don't see perfection because they won't see that but they see consistency in our daily living listen we can be a light to those around us who are lost well, Lord willing the next time we're together if God so leads us we're going to finish this message finish out this chapter um, before we do we want to close out in a word of prayer Lord we thank you for the opportunity to look at the word today uh, Father, we just want to pray, Lord, that you would bless us, God, and all your people, Lord, that have seen and will see uh, this message. We pray, God, it would be a blessing to them, Lord. We ask, dear God, those who will see and are seeing that are lost, we pray, Lord, for their souls. Pray, God, that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Uh, Lord, we just want to uh, praise you and lift up your name and ask you, God, to bless all your people, Lord, who will be giving out the word today. Again, we pray, Lord, for lost souls everywhere that will be watching and hearing the word of God. Praying, Lord, they would come to you believing in your Son. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Well, thank you guys for letting us be with you today and joining us. Um, Lord willing, we're going to uh, try to be back um, at the latest on Wednesday at 6. So, um I'll be sure to post, and we're going to try to finish out, Lord willing, this chapter and um, and uh, continue on this message of practical Christian living. So I hope you guys have a fantastic day. Uh, God bless, and I hope to see you next time.